In this section we will discuss about conservation of momentum and energy in collision. Here we will tackle some physical phenomenon that happens when two or more objects interact with one another like pushing objects at rest or objects collide with one another. Here we will discuss about momentum and collisions to describe such phenomenon and determine quantities that we can predict as accurate as possible. Momentum or linear momentum denoted by P which is the product of the mass and velocity of an object, we see that it is a vector quantity with its direction given by the velocity component. Recall Newton's second law or law of acceleration which is the sum of forces is proportional to the mass times acceleration, we rewrite this as an expression in terms of momentum which gives us the derivative of momentum over derivative of time. Impulse denoted by the symbol J is just the change in momentum. Note that impulse is also a vector quantity. We examine how we can rewrite impulse as an expression of force. Recall the rewritten expression of the second law in terms of momentum and rewrite this as dP equals sum of forces times dt which we integrate from an initial to a final position which is the integral of the sum of forces times dt. where we note that the impulse is also the difference of momentum which we substitute this to the previous expression and obtain a rewritten expression for the impulse as J equals the change momentum equals force times change in time. In this figure we see three scenario, the first scenario we have two objects one and two moving towards one another with different masses and velocities. At the second scenario these mass collide with one another then separates with opposite direction as depicted in the third scenario. The expression written is an expression that describes mathematically the conservation of momentum which is the initial momentums of the objects is equal to the momentums of the objects after collision. Note that we have to assume that there are no other forces involved here but only with the two masses 1 and 2. Another thing we should remember is the nature of forces that are involved during collision. Here we have a figure of mass containing molecules or masses inside that are able to move freely but limited inside the boundary of a system. You can also imagine this as a human body and the masses that interaction inside as the organs of the body. In collisions we only consider the forces that external and we assume that the forces that are interacting inside the body bounded by a boundary are not considered. So the momentum considered here are contributed only from the sum of external forces that interact with the body. Now here we show again the reason for conservation of momentum when the net external force is zero. This would suggest that the momentum is constant and the change of momentum would be zero which shows again that the momentum is conserved for constant momentum for net external force zero. Shown here is a scenario of two masses M1 and M2 before, during, and after collision on a horizontal surface which is assumed to be frictionless. As the two bodies collide both the momentum and energy are conserved then it is called elastic collision. Rewriting the equation we get the formulation for conservation of momentum and of energy for an elastic collision. We can then substitute the equation to get an expression for the final velocities after collision. So here we are rewriting the equation and get equation 17 and 18 from the conservation of momentum and energy. We then substitute equation 17 to 18 and get equation 19. Using equation 19 and substitute this to get an expression for V2 prime shown as equation 20. Further simplifying this we get an equation for V1 prime shown in equation 21. Using equations 20 obtain equation 21 an expression for V1 prime. 
Simplifying this we get an expression for V2 prime shown in equation 22. Here we have an example for collision. A ball with mass 2m is moving in the positive x-axis with an initial speed positive 10 meter per second hits a second ball with mass m that is initially at rest. After collision both balls move in the same axis along the positive x-axis with second ball moving at speed of positive 5 meter per second. Find the final speed of the first ball. First step we use the ideal equation for this problem. This problem is an example of elastic collision so we use the equations for conservation of momentum and rewriting it to solve for V1 prime. After substituting the values from the given, we see that for this type of elastic collision the velocity mass 1 which is V1 prime is 2.5 meter per seconds. When two bodies collide and only the momentum is conserved then it is called an inelastic collision. Here we have two masses on a frictionless surface. Both masses are moving towards one another then collides with each other. After collision they are joined together with the same velocity. Considering the equation for momentum we can plug in the details and extract from the scenario and we get equation 23. Solving for the final velocity after collision we get equation 24. In this situation we have two cars in an example of inelastic collision. So, a 2000 kg car moving at 30 km per hour strikes a stopped 1000 kg car and the two lock bumpers. For letter A, what is their final common velocity just after the collision? The first step is to use the ideal equation for this problem. So for a non-elastic problem we use the equation for its final velocity then substitute the values gained from the given problem and we see that both cars move at a speed of 20 km per hour. Here we have a 200 gram glider and a 600 gram glider are coupled together and move along a frictionless air track at 50 cm per second. An explosive charge on one of the gliders separates them causing the 200 gram glider to stop. What is the subsequent velocity of the 600 gram glider? Here we have problem that is sort of an inverse of the inelastic collision. First we draw the problem and determine the physical quantities that are involved. So we see here that as the gliders move the track is frictionless so no frictional force is involved. After explosion they separate with an unknown velocity for the second glider with mass 600 grams. Second step is to use the ideal equation. So we use the equation for the conservation of momentum and rewrite this to solve for the velocity of the second mass after explosion. We get that the value for the velocity of the 600 grams glider is around 67 cm per second. Now we know objects do not just move in singular axis but rather in two or more axis. So, we examine when two objects collide and moves in a two-dimensional plane. Here we have a situation where mass 1 collides with mass 2 which is at rest and after collision both masses separates with direction that is non-singular axis. To mathematically express this we simply use the momentum at different axis. So, we consider the quantities along the x axis or determine its x components along x. We get that only the momentum by mass 1 is present since mass 2 is initially at rest and after collision both masses have momentum but as a cosine function of their respective angles since we consider only the x component of their velocities. Similarly, for the y component both mass 1 and 2 do not have a y component since their motion is only along x for mass 1 and at rest for mass 2. But for their y component velocities they are both present as a function of sine of their angles. For motions that is elastic the energy is calculated by using equation 13.
In this example we have two ice skaters, Daniel with mass 65 kg and Rebecca with mass 45 kg, are practicing. Daniel stops to tie his shoelace and, while at rest, is struck by Rebecca, who is moving at 13 m per second before she collides with him. After the collision Rebecca has a velocity of magnitude 8 m per second at an angle of 53.1 degrees from her initial direction. Both skaters move on the frictionless horizontal surface of the rink. For letter A, what are the magnitude and direction of Daniel's velocity after the collision? For letter B, what is the change in total kinetic energy of the skaters as a result of the collision? First we draw the problem and identify the quantities. We see here that the problem is as an example of collision in two-dimensional motion. We note that the angle after collision mass 1 or moves in the first quarter and we assume that the direction of second mass would be sensible it moves on the fourth quarter and so it is assumed that mass 2 vertical component is negative. We then write the equations along the two axes. For the x-axis, we see that it can be simplified after substitution we turn it into equation A. Similarly, we do the same for the y direction and simplify it to equation B. The third step is to use the ideal equations to solve for letter A. We do this by using equations obtained earlier and rewriting the first equation and obtain an expression for the velocity for the second mass post collision as equation A prime. We then rewrite equation B and write it as an expression for theta prime for the second mass. We then substitute equation A prime to B prime and solve for the position of the mass 2 after collision which is equal to 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal. Then this angle is used and substitute it to a prime and we get the magnitude of the velocity of second mass which is 7.2 meter per seconds. Note that we can substitute theta prime to equation B prime also and obtain the same value of the magnitude of the velocity of the second mass. For letter B, we are to find the total kinetic energy of the skaters as a result of the collision. We take the difference of the kinetic energy after minus kinetic energy total to determine this value. We see that the change of total kinetic energy is equal to the negative of 678 joules. Here we talk about another concept in physics which is the center of mass. So far we have assumed that when an object moves it moves as if it is frozen in the sense that it appears to be stationary with respect to its axis. But in reality when objects move in space the behavior of this object is altered by the shape and arrangement of its mass. Shown in the figure when you threw something symmetrical like a ball and something that is not completely symmetrical in all dimension like a bat. The ball would appear the same as it is thrown but the bat would appear that it is rotating but both cases we see a point in in the shape of the mass that appears constant all throughout which here we see it as a red dot and this position is called the center of mass. All objects have a center of mass which we use to simplify the interaction of forces for a given object with mass and shape. How do we calculate this position? First we consider a system with two mass M1 and M2, although the center of mass can be applied to multiple mass system which we will show later. The center of mass for the system which is along the x-axis is simply the sum of the mass times its position of each masses over the total mass of the system. This will give us the value of the center of mass along the x-axis. As observed, the center of mass is dependent on the lengths and masses of the system. Here we have multiple masses and to calculate to the center of masses we simply sum all the masses times its corresponding positions over the total mass of the system as shown by the equation.
Here we have multiple masses in two dimensional space and as you can see to determine the center of mass we have to take the components hence we have these two equations for the center mass calculation. As you can guess for a three dimensional space, to determine the position of the center mass we add ZCM or the center of mass along the Z axis as shown in equation 27. We can write the center of mass in vector form by plugging the values of X, Y and Z center of masses to equation 28. As mentioned earlier that shape and distribution of masses alters the position of the center of mass. Here we have different people and see the different position of the center of mass as indicated by the red cross. In this sample, we are asked to find the center of mass of a system consisting of three particles, M1 equals to 2 kilograms at the origin, M2 equals 4 kilograms on the y-axis at y equals to 3 meters, and M3 on the x-axis at x equals to 4 meters. You can refer to the figure for more details. The first step is to use the right equations. Using equations 25 and 26 for finding the center of mass in a two-dimensional situm. We then calculate the total mass which is 12 kilograms which we will substitute to the equations. For center of mass along the x-axis we see that masses M1 and M2 lies on the origin then their positions are 0 and we are left only with mass 3. So the center of mass along the x-axis is equal to 2 meters. For the y-axis, we see that mass 3 is on the origin so we have only mass 1 and 2 for this. Here the center of mass along the y-axis is about 1.7 meters. So if we draw this to the figure, the center of mass in a two-dimension is indicated by the red dot having the coordinates 2 and 1.7 meters. So far we have learned that for multiple bodied system the forces interact on the center of mass of the system. Now we will try to get a much more deeper understanding of moving objects in a translation motion. So we see here on the figure a person diving. As the projectile it moves at different speeds along the y-axis as it jumps, reaching the highest point where the velocity is zero, and when it lands on the surface of water. We will examine this behavior by incorporating our understanding of motion on two-dimensional plane. So we know that only external forces are considered for systems that we are measuring and this allows us calculate models for forces interacting on objects. We also know that these forces are simplified by interacting on the mass's center of mass which we can calculate by taking the sum of mass and position over its total mass. If we take the derivative of the center of mass over time we can get an expression of velocity and specifically it is the velocity of the center mass. Now this velocity is familiar to us because we can take this as an acceleration of the system. The expression written shows that the acceleration simply shows the acceleration that is related to its center of mass. which we can relate now to Newton's second law or law of acceleration which suggests that the sum of external forces is proportional to the total mass of the system times its acceleration of its center of mass. So, the sum of all the forces acting on the system is equal to the total mass of the system times the acceleration of its center of mass. This statement is Newton's second law for a system of particles. Thus, we can conclude that at the center of mass of a system of particles, or bodies, with total mass m moves like a single particle of mass m acted upon by the same net external force.
we can also write an expression of momentum as shown here. So we can rewrite the expression for the center of mass velocity and relate this to the expression of momentum for multi-bodied system which is the sum masses and corresponding velocities. Applying this to the previous expression of external force we get the expression for momentum in terms of center of mass velocity. The end for now and I hope you learned something new today. For questions and comments you may send them to diyeslearningstuff at gmail.com. You may review the slide on YouTube at diyes at diyeslearningstuff. Note, please do not forget to use your school email. Also write your complete name and class section. Thank you for listening and see next meeting.